Hello, my name's Adrian Goldberg and welcome to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times is what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what telly doesn't tell you. This time, what's happening to the COVID inquiry? Its chair, Baroness Heather Hallett, is having to take the government to a judicial review in the hope of releasing unredacted phone messages sent by Boris Johnson when he was Prime Minister at the height of the pandemic. The Cabinet Office won't readily let go of what it says is unambiguously irrelevant material. In a further twist, Johnson himself said he's happy to hand over the messages, but Rishi Sunak, who entered Downing Street promising a new era of transparency, is blocking him. We're going to hear from Ian Overton, who's been trying for years to get the government to open up about secret WhatsApp communications, both via Byline Times and the advocacy group The Citizens. We're also joined by Byline Times chief reporter Josiah Mortimer. Before we get cracking, just a reminder that the Byline Times podcast is funded by subscriptions to The Byline Times, our brilliant monthly newspaper, which combines the best of our online offerings with content you can't read anywhere else. Find out how to subscribe over at bylinetimes.com. And don't forget as well, our new film over at Byline TV with John Sweeney, Caelan Robertson and Zarina Zabriskie. It's called The Eastern Front, Terror and Torture in Ukraine. You can watch it at byline.tv. Let's start with you, Josiah. Where exactly are we up to in this WhatsApp row? Yeah, so uh, the COVID inquiry kicks off properly next week and there's a really powerful and bitter battle going on about how the COVID inquiry has access to information shared by ministers. Uh, In particular, obviously, the focus has been on Boris Johnson and and some of his personal notebooks. It's reached a crescendo recently with uh, the government taking the COVID inquiry to court to basically block the unredacted handover of some of these documents, including Boris Johnson's notebooks from when he was Prime Minister at the start of the pandemic, and also his his old phone as well, the phone number of which was leaked online in 2021. He had to ditch it and turn it off. But it's quite a remarkable situation we're in, you know, where, where the COVID inquiry that the government set up saying it wanted to get to the, the truth of how the pandemic was handled or, or mishandled is now trying to go to essentially war with it in the courts to block the release of key information that relates to you know Boris Johnson and, and his dealings with, in particular, people like Rishi Sunak, who's obviously now Prime Minister. Now, the government argues that the material that it's redacting is unambiguously irrelevant, is the phrase that they keep trotting out. But uh, it does seem quite clear that, you know, in the law, there's a, a piece of legislation called the Inquiries Act that the chair, it's for her to decide, Baroness Hallett, what she can get hold of and, and not for you know, the, the government to be sort of just jury and executioner in deciding what potentially incriminating evidence it, it decides to give to her or not. Baroness Hallett says that she wants all these messages. It's hard to see how that can be countermanded by a judicial review. Exactly. And I think, you know, the opposition have been saying probably what many voters will think when, uh, you know, they look at this. And it does very much look like the government's just trying to hide embarrassing information that could land Rishi Sunak and his uh, now cabinet colleagues in, in hot water. I think a lot of the coverage is focused on, you know, it's just being about Boris Johnson. But actually, you know, given that we've had 13 years in the same party in power, lots of the same figures still hanging around. I'm not really that keen on seeing some of their WhatsApp messages and, you know, other, other forms of communications released uh, to the wider public. Yeah, Sunak himself, of course, was one of the more sceptical figures about the benefits of lockdown. Who knows, perhaps he has something to fear himself. Exactly. And I think, you know, at at the core of this, what it comes down to is the families that lost their loved ones during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, it's very easy to just focus on personalities involved but you know they really want answers and it was very clear listening to the one of the procedural hearings in the past week or so speaker after speaker who was representing the bereaved families you know was absolutely just aghast really that the government was trying to hold up the inquiry and you know the hearing's not for another few weeks now you know it could could drag on even longer I think it looks like it's it's just getting in the way of having an inquiry that has full information and, and can actually give us some proper answers. 
Ian, uh, I think it's really important to stress that there is a bigger context here. It's a context that you've reported on frequently at Byline Times. It's a context that you've investigated through your work with the citizens as well. And that is this whole question of government secrecy, the entitlement or otherwise of journalists to see WhatsApp messages and other secret communications between senior politicians. Absolutely. It was back in September 2019, where I sort of woke up in the morning and thought, I wonder if anyone has asked whether they've had correspondence between Dominic Cummings, uh, then special advisor to then Prime Minister Boris Johnson, and thinking, well, this is a civil servant. Dominic Cummings is is uh, a paid civil servant at the time. And I thought, well, I wonder who's vetting their communications. And you had had a few moments in the press where people had talked about WhatsApp usage, but nobody had tried to ask for it under freedom of information. So I called up the press office and said, can I put in a request for correspondence on this date? And their immediate response was incredibly hostile. And I just suddenly thought, well, this is a bit strange. I don't know why you were so defensive. It's just a method of communication. So I then put in a freedom of information request, and then that began to be delayed. And then after a couple of months, I got a response saying it would cost too much. Okay, and then I challenged that, and I said, okay, well, why don't we have less less communication asked for? So the cost isn't that great. And then they said we don't have the data you want. So then I re rejigged my question to ask for something where it was clearly there was data because it was on a specific date and we knew that Dominic Cummings almost certainly had WhatsApp the Prime Minister. Then they said my question didn't constitute a reasonable request under FOI, so I changed it again. And then they said that merely to confirm or deny whether the Prime Minister and Dominic Cummings used WhatsApp would pose a security risk to the nation, because then it would enable um, hackers to get into their systems. This is ignoring the fact that WhatsApp is owned by Meta, uh, formerly of Facebook, and so is not even a UK-owned communication platform. I then got more evidence that the use of WhatsApp had been already admitted by government, and therefore this claim was spurious. And then it came full circle back to it being a cost issue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I put in a subject access request, which is a request to find out details about what people think of write about you in private communications, because you're allowed to get information based on you as an individual. I put in a subject access request to number 10, found out that there'd been lots of talk about me being a, a persistent and vexatious journalist, that um, I wasn't going to go away on this. And all of this really combined into a case where with the citizens, this advocacy group, we took the government to the High Court to, to demand release of WhatsApp. The judge, though, he basically came to the conclusion that this was a policy decision about the release or non-release of WhatsApp. And essentially, you know, let unto Caesar be Caesar's. He said, let policymakers dictate on policy and let the judges dictate on law. So effectively, he threw it out based on the notion that this was policy. However, that kind of claim that this was essentially a political issue has, of course, been turned slightly on its head now, because obviously this is being pursued as a legal threat by uh, the COVID inquiry against the government. So I think that that argument as to whether it re resides in the realm of policy or resides in the realm of law, i.e. falling under the freedom of information law, is of, of use. But during the course of that court case, one of the claims was that, and this was made by the chief operating officer of number 10, was that they routinely collected and saved Prime Minister's WhatsApp messages. So I asked them, how many WhatsApp messages have you saved to the Prime Minister? They refused to tell me. I then asked, can I see any of the WhatsApp messages that were handed to Sue Gray in her party gate review? They refused to give me that. And essentially, they've absolutely failed to show that they have saved one singular WhatsApp message in any time under the last five years. 
And I really believe that there is a, a, a potential that the Cabinet Office misled the courts in its claims of saving WhatsApp, where they claim that they did so, but in reality, they didn't. Because if they had done so, they wouldn't have to be asking Boris Johnson for his WhatsApp messages. At the heart of this is a really important principle, which is that ministers and civil servants are working for us at our cost in a way that should be accountable ultimately to us. And if the suspicion is that communications apps like WhatsApp were used to circumvent accountability, then that is plainly wrong. But that has to be, at the moment, the suspicion that that's what's going on here. Absolutely. I, I think that there are kind of two hats you can wear here. The one is the accountability of the present, and the other is the preservation of the present for the future. So on the one hand, we have major decisions being made that are not on government communication channels, including messages between ministers and Tory donors in relation to potential contracts being offered. And we know that, that there were those communications that happened under COVID, where Tory donors then went on to communicate with ministers on WhatsApp, or at least we knew that they were communicating on phones, because we, we got the evidence from Matt Hancock's side of things, that they then went on to win major government contracts. So there is an issue of accountability, of graft, of potential corruption, a whole issue of, of shining a light into the dark recesses of government here. But there's also a matter for the historians of the future. It could be in 200 years' time, historians will look back at this period and think, did these ministers communicate with each other in any way, shape or form? Because hitherto, you'd always get column notes scrawled in by former prime ministers in letters and missives dating back to the Elizabethan times, where you would get an insight into the mechanisms of government based on um, handwritten notes that then were passed down over the centuries. This ephemera of digital communication means that nothing will be captured. And whilst we'll have the occasional formal um, letter being written, we won't ha understand the real ways in which government operates. Now, the detractors, the ones who claim that WhatsApp should be a secret, they say that, oh, these are, these messages are just for ordering coffee, or these are just the sort of conversations you'd have in the corridor. I just don't buy it. And I think we should be able to examine the truth of that. Is this just coffee messages or just tittle-tattle? My gut feeling is not. My gut feeling is that there are donors asking for favours. We know that David Cameron was text messaging the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, in relation to Greensill lobbying. We know that Tory donors uh, managed to secure major contracts with private communications of the ministers um, as a, a pre-warning to that. So we know that there is a real uh, capacity here for the violation of the trust that we hand over to those who govern us. But I think it's not only about exposing the potential corruption of the present, it's about understanding uh, in the entirety of how government operates. And if there's a major area that we're, we're, where journalists and the public are never allowed access to, it becomes a kind of a secret walled garden of power, which becomes unbreachable. And I don't think that, that is good for democracy. It's not good for transparency. And ultimately, it's not good for the um, official public future record. And Josiah, there's a, a, a twist as well here in that ministers or their advisers appear to be free to share these messages with the public when they choose, most obviously Dominic Cummings in June 2021, through his blog, he published WhatsApp messages, which revealed that Matt Hancock had been described as totally effing useless by Boris Johnson. So it's kind of weird, isn't it, that we're not allowed to see the messages, but individuals who are party to the messages can publish them when they deem it to be in their interest to do so. Exactly. And we, and we actually know from the Matt Hancock's messages, the former health secretary, that 
WhatsApp is very much used for, for policy making today. It's not it's not tangential. It is at the heart of government. And that's why I think Ian's work on this has been so important. I, I'm also interested to to know, you know, whether other encrypted apps like Signal and, and Telegram are, are being sort of probed for, for this information. Because, uh, you know, I imagine there's more, more scrutiny is shown on WhatsApp that ministers might end up moving to a, other apps that they see as more private. But that's right. You know, I think ministers, MPs, they, they tend to try and control the narrative on stuff and leak stuff selectively to friendly papers like The Telegraph. We only end up hearing snapshots. And that's why I think it's so important that, you know, we have a, a really complete picture of this. And more importantly, that, you know, the inquiry has a really complete picture of this and, and has all the information in front of it. I think one of the, the, the very important things about this is what solution could easily be adopted. And of course, the official solution is, you know, give ministers their own state phone, give special advisors a phone and say that everything on this will be captured. And you can have your private phone for your, shall we meet up for a pizza later, chats. But if it is found that those private phones have been used for official business, there should be breaches of the ministerial code or official sanctions as part of the civil service. I mean, it's not rocket science. I'm sure the British government could develop its own secure communications on its own phones. We already know that former heads of the intelligence services have already claimed how concerned they are with this widespread use of encrypted corporate software on uh, public and private phones. But if it's just found that ministers are breaching a, a, a very clear thing, they are using private phones for official business, this will then be able to be held up in the courts either of public opinion or even officially in the courts, as we're seeing currently uh, being pushed through on the COVID inquiry. So I don't think that this is like us as journalists asking for something that is either unreasonable nor untenable. Uh, There's an easy solution that could be achieved. There has yet to be one official WhatsApp message released by number 10 in any capacity as part of any public finding. And I think that that just smacks of contempt for the engagement of the public on these issues. Yeah, early this year, the Cabinet Office did issue new guidance discouraging the use of private messaging apps like WhatsApp on government business, precisely to improve accountability and transparency. So somewhere there is a recognition that this is an issue. I think so. And and, and I mean, it's, it's a rare case as a journalist where you come across something that nobody's really discussing and you begin to dig into it and you stick your feet in, you become stubborn and you keep on pushing. And I'd like to think, and I've got no proof of this, but I'd like to think that it's people like the citizens, potentially some of my own reporting and others who have really kind of pushed and pushed and pushed on this that might, without their admitting it, have led to the arc of change within government itself. And I kind of examined those new recommendations and thought, well, you know, what they're trying to do probably was in response to the fact that we took them to the High Court to try and um, instigate this. So maybe there is a small victory there. But I do worry that this is a kind of emperor's new clothes victory, because we've seen no proof that any of this is actually happening. As I said before, Number 10 is still refusing to tell me how many WhatsApp messages they've even saved. So we can't really hold to account a government on its claim of everything's changed, we're all better now, yes, we've moved on, unless they actually are transparent as to what those changes have actually achieved. So the fight still goes on and um, it won't be the last FOI they get from me. Josiah, when I speak to MPs and ministers, they sometimes say to me, we need to be able to do blue skies thinking. We need to be able to kick ideas around, which may come to nothing, but we need the freedom to be able to say, perhaps sometimes daft things that very quickly we realise are daft, but we have to have that freedom to say things without them necessarily being in the public domain. And that if you demand to see every message, then that could actually be a a freeze, a chill on proper examination of issues, on just free thinking in general amongst ministers. 
I think people understand that there's there's a certain amount of credibility to that argument. But I think the balance that we have at the minute is so far in the direction of keeping everything completely private. And the fact that the government's taking the COVID inquiry to court, those WhatsApps won't necessarily be, be published. They certainly won't be sharing actually irrelevant information. They are trying to hide it from an inquiry that is set out to get to the bottom of uh, you know how the pandemic was handled. And I think when you, when you see it in that con- context, it does very much look like you know the ball is entirely in the government's court at the moment on this, and uh, that just can't be right. And that is ultimately a, a political calculation that they're making, isn't it? On the one hand, they're saying we want a, a fully transparent COVID inquiry. We want to know exactly what lessons need to be learned from the pandemic. At the same time, we're not going to put all the information into the public domain. So will I be seen by the public as covering up? And will that be better for them or worse than anything that might emerge from these WhatsApp messages? Exactly. And it, and it all looks even more farcical when you consider the fact that Boris Johnson in you know quite a, a, a sneaky, typically of him, move has offered to give over all of his uh, WhatsApps and um, many of his WhatsApps, I should say, and his diaries in, in unadapted form to the inquiry. And yet still, you know, the government is saying that they need to, to vet the copies of that first before they hand anything over. So you could end up with the government going to court for the right to redact messages that the inquiry already ends up having. At the end of the day, this comes down to a principle in the government size that it should be able to keep many more things private. And actually, that just hasn't kept up to date with the digital age. I think it's worth remembering, you know, way back to 2016, do you consider that Hillary Clinton partly lost the presidential election back then because she sent a few emails from her personal email account? Well, now we know that thousands of messages are going back and forth on private telephones belonging to, to MPs and ministers with you know, almost no scrutiny, no oversight and, and very, very little storage, it seems. So we are in a very, very strange position and, and it's one that you know desperately needs to be clarified, I think. Josiah, thank you. Thanks also to Ian Overton. I'm Adrian Goldberg, and I've produced this episode of the Byline Times podcast. If you want to support our work, then please take out a subscription to the Byline Times and get more information over at bylinetimes.com. And I'd also point you to byline.tv, where you can watch our fantastic new documentary with John Sweeney, The Eastern Front, Terror and Torture in Ukraine uncovering Russian war crimes. I'm Adrian Goldberg. This has been a We Bring Audio production for the Byline Times. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon. Cheers now. Bye-bye.